You promote a starch-based diet, which is obviously high in carbohydrates. Um, I was wondering, where did this whole notion that carbs make it fat and you should stay away from starches originate from? I think it, uh, it, I think it has some industrial connection. Uh, I'd have to be uh, embellishing the story a little bit, but I'm certain if I could get into the details, it would be well established. Uh, back in 1977, we had the uh, dietary goals of the U.S. established by George McGovern, the senator, Democratic senator from South Dakota. And uh, <clears throat> when they wrote those dietary goals, they were going to uh, uh, try and improve the health of Americans by fixing their diet, specifically by cutting down on the animal food intake which had been identified by Mark Hagstead, other experts, as causing heart disease, many of our common forms of cancer, obesity, and so on. So there was a, a direct attack against the meat, dairy, egg, and other animal food industries, <clears throat> amongst other parts of the food industry. But that was one of the most important parts. And the meat and the dairy lobbyists, uh, their political connections, stood up and uh, stopped the dietary goals for the U.S. Uh, by the end of 1977. They were essentially abolished within a year, uh, changed completely to favor the uh, meat and dairy industry. In the process, uh, the industries learned how to control terminology, words. And one of the words that became associated at that time with uh, obesity, fatness, unhealthiness was the word starch. Prior to that, uh, experts used to talk about starch. Homemakers, grandmas, mothers, and so on used to talk about the starchy part of their diet as an energy part, as the central part of the meal plan. After that, starch became vilified. I would have to look up all the details on how and why, but the net effect is people no longer had a reliable, time-honored source of calories when you equate starch, beans, peas, lentils, rice, bread, etc., with something evil. And so starch became an evil word, and industry made a major, con major contribution there. Just like industry, when they have guidelines for Americans created, say, through the United States Department of Agriculture, every five years the USDA puts out uh, uh, guidelines for Americans to be healthier, and in the process of writing those guidelines, industry, which is involved directly with the USDA, industry insists that the verbiage in uh, these particular guidelines not identify meat, dairy, and eggs as being bad. When they refer to unhealthy things in relation to meat, dairy, and eggs, they say saturated fat. Saturated fat is bad for you. Well, the consumer, again, doesn't know how to act because they don't know what a saturated fat looks like, but saturated fat is meat, dairy, and eggs. Rather, if they'd say in these uh, particular guidelines, uh, if you eat meat, dairy, and eggs, you'll get heart disease, strokes, uh, et cetera, that would be much more damning for industry. So industry has controlled terminology. Uh, they have done it actively and passively. The other thing that happened that contributed to this is the, uh, the popularity of low-carb diets, like the Atkins diet. Uh, these low-carb diets, which again began in the 70s with Robert Atkins, I believe his first book was 1972, uh, they showed Americans, not a new idea, these kind of diets have been around for at least 100 years prior to Atkins, they showed Americans that if you made yourself sick enough, and I do mean sick enough, uh, by eating such a bizarre meal plan, as a all meat, dairy, egg meal plan with no carbohydrates that you would lose weight because you became sick. Uh, the part of that manifestation of sickness is ketosis. You go into ketosis, you lose your appetite. Uh, because of this illness, and i got to emphasize illness, because of this illness, it's not a blissful state of ketosis as the uh, promoters say. Because of this illness, uh, you can't eat and you lose weight. Well, you go out of this state of illness, ketosis, if you just eat a small amount of starch, carbohydrate, starch, that's, that's what we're talking about. Uh, you ruin ketosis, so you ruin the Atkins diet. I think that's part of the reason, too. But for whatever reason, in the U.S. and in several other countries, starch is equated with uh, laundry detergent or laundry stiffening products, 
Uh, it's associated, once you get into the food category, with white bread, glop, you know, cookie dough. Uh, and then the, uh, the ultimate defaming of starch, incorrectly, falsehood, about starch is you can't eat starch because starch makes you fat. And every listener can figure that out. They just stop for a minute and they think of starch eating populations. For example, the Asians. You pick any of the Asian populations like where we have Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand and China and Japan. You pick any of these populations and when they were still rice eaters, 90% of their diet came from rice back before the 1980s. There were no fat people. I mean, you could look at a, at a, a village of 100,000 people and there's not a fat person in the village. Now, of course, in China and Japan and other Asian countries, they've abandoned their starch rice-based diet and picked up the American fare and they look like it. I mean, they're fat, greasy and bald just like, uh, just like Americans have been for 70, 80, 90 years. But that, that modernization took place in Asia over the last 30 years so people can still see it. Right. Yeah, so it sounds like a lot of uh, industry has played a big role in that. And it's amazing how you've even said this before that people have lived on starch for thousands of years. And now it's only been a short amount of time that people have sort of neglected that. Well, it's in the U.S. too. They tell me in German, in the German language, starch means strength. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a word association that has occurred in some of our industrialized countries and not others. And as I do say, definitely industry has profited, the meat, dairy, and egg industry. And they did have an active role in changing everything back in 1977 when the McGovern Report came out. And they fought it for a year. It was published in February 77. By the end of the year, meat, dairy, and eggs with their lobbyists, their political connections had completely changed the goals and ruined any opportunity of helping Americans, individuals, as well as our nation, as did Luther Terry, who was our Surgeon General back in 1964 when he published the uh, Surgeon General's report on smoking and health. He changed America. Uh, he changed, uh, well, primarily America, and it, it has, uh, has also spread over into Europe now and maybe into Asia and Africa soon that smoking it will kill you. It's a bad habit. Well, Luther Terry introduced that in 1964. McGovern and his group tried to do the same thing with food that they did with smoking in 1977. And C. Everett Koop tried to do the same thing again with the Surgeon General's report on nutrition and health in 1985. And each time industry has come back with new resolve, new strength, new determination. And this isn't just going to happen to us. Uh, it's not going to happen to big food like it happened to big tobacco and big alcohol. Uh, and the reason is, I mean, part of the reason well, part of the reason is the economic strength of the food industry compared to alcohol and tobacco. They're hugely larger business businesses and also the public consumption. Uh, I would say oh, nine out of ten people can understand that alcohol abuse is a killer. Uh, it results in, uh, in family violence. It results in auto accidents. And so nine out of ten people are uh, sane when it comes to looking at that problem. The hardcore drunks can't see a problem. And likewise, with cigarette smoking in the 1980s and 70s, half the population didn't smoke. So half could see the insanity of smoking. So we had a chance. Now, the problem today with the food industry is that 99, well, maybe not, maybe it's down to 97%. 97% of the consumers uh, are facing meat, dairy, and eggs every day, every meal, every plate, every bite, and they can't see the insanity. It's only the small percentage of us, let's guess 3%, who switched over to vegetarian diets who can see this insanity like a non-smoker or a non-alcoholic could see the other problems. So it continues uh, because of the economic issues and because the consumer knows no better. They just accept sickness as part of a way of life. 